following program is a presentation of the NASA Institute featuring a lecture by Dr. Art Carden. Dr. Carden teaches economics at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. He is also a research fellow with the Independent Institute, a senior fellow of the Beacon Center of Tennessee, a member of the adjunct faculty of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, and a Jack Miller Center Fellow. His research has appeared in journals like the Journal of Urban Economics, Public Choice, and Contemporary Economic Policy. And he is a regular contributor to Forbes.com. This fall, he will join the faculty at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, where he will also be a fellow in the University Center for Science and Religion. First thing I want to talk about is a date, specifically July 31st. A couple things are going to happen on July 31st of this year. First, our son Jacob is going to turn four years old. And we're going to party like he just turned four years old. We love our son Jacob. He's so wonderful. He's so great. He's a great big brother to his little sister Taylor Grace, who is going to be two years old on June 16th. And he's going to be a great big brother to his little brother David Simon, who is due on June 28th. Okay? Thank you so much. So, so, we are, uh, so we're thrilled that we're going to be celebrating Jacob's, Jacob's fourth birthday on July 31st. Were he still with us, Milton Friedman would celebrate his 100th birthday on July 31st. So it's in this light that I want to think about some of the contributions of Friedman and some of the contributions of the other thinkers in the classical liberal tradition to the world that we live in today to the kind of prosperity that we enjoy in countries like the United States and Canada and Western Europe and some of their, some of their overseas, overseas offshoots and the prosperity that's growing in countries like India and China that are beginning to adopt the institutions of liberty and the institutions of economic freedom. 50 years ago in 1962, Friedman published his classic book, Capitalism and Freedom. It's a book that stands with books like Hayek's The Road to Serfdom as one of the 20th century's most influential defenses of the free economy. As an economist and father, I spend a lot of time thinking about my kids' futures. I spend a lot of time thinking about the legacy that I'm going to leave them. I spend a lot of time, too, thinking about the legacy of those who have come before us. And specifically, the, the intellectual legacy of Milton Friedman is one of freedom, prosperity, and dignity. If we listen to the lessons that he and others working in the classical liberal tradition have to teach, then ours and our children's futures will be much, much brighter. So we're going to consider a couple of different things. Uh, so if you want to jot down a quick outline. First, we're going to talk briefly about the economic way of thinking and the use of knowledge in society. Second, we're going to consider what's happened in countries that have adopted free market policies in what, uh, what the economist Andre Schleifer has called the age of Milton Friedman. Third, we're going to consider the alternatives to free market capitalism, and we're going to consider the consequences of the use of force in an interventionist society. Finally, I'm going to close with a plea for humility on the part of economists, intellectuals, and policymakers. It's going to be a plea for humility that originates in the work of Adam Smith and that is at the heart of the classical liberal tradition. Before we, uh, before we go on, though, let's consider some of the basic principles of economics. Let's consider first the economic way of thinking and the use of knowledge in society. There are a couple of key ideas in economics. First and foremost, people act. People choose goals. They seek ways to achieve those goals. Second, every action has a cost. Resources are scarce, which means that if you're using your time, your talent, and your treasure for one thing, you are necessarily not using it for something else. To use just one example, you're here right now. You're listening to me talk about economics. This means that you're giving up the opportunity, the opportunity to do whatever else you could be doing. You could be relaxing on the beach. You could be smoking a cigar. You could be taking a walk. You could be enjoying your dessert. All right. I see that every, everyone, everyone, is, everyone is getting dessert. Presumably, I hope, I hope, that, dessert, I hope that dessert and economics are complements and not substitutes. Okay. <clears throat> you might be watching this on TV right now, uh, which means you're not uh, watching old episodes of The Simpsons or Family Guy or something like that. You might be watching this on YouTube, which means you're not watching Lady Gaga videos. Every action has a cost. To do one thing, you have to give up the opportunity to do others, and markets economize on these costs by making them very, very explicit. People respond to changes in the cost and benefits of different courses of action. In other words, people respond to incentives. 
The great economist Steven Landsberg said one time that pretty much all of economics can be summarized as follows. People respond to incentives, all the rest is commentary. This has incredibly important implications for the organization of society, for institutions, and for the kinds of incentives that those institutions produce. When we change people's incentives, we change their actions. When we change the rules, in other words, when we change the institutions, we change people's incentives. When people have incentives to produce and trade, for example, they have incentives to create wealth. One of the most surprising conclusions in all of economic analysis is the fact that trade creates wealth. Trade allows us to do more with what we have. It allows us to get stuff more cheaply. It allows us to produce more. As barriers to trade crumble, the things that we buy get cheaper. But here's the cool thing. When the barriers to trade crumble, the things that we sell, specifically things like our labor, get more expensive. They earn more. Sellers get more for the sweat of their brow, and buyers have to sweat less for the things that they buy because of the wealth-creating properties of trade. In a commercial society characterized by secure private property rights and voluntary exchange, one person's gain is another person's gain as well. In a free market, the market itself, the process of buying and selling, harnesses knowledge, and then this knowledge is transmitted through the prices that emerge. When people have incentives to expropriate and redistribute, on the other hand, things aren't quite as cheery. In a political society that's characterized by expropriation and redistribution, one person's gain is necessarily another person's loss. In an extractive society, in a political society, in a world where we're redistributing resources, if I get richer, it's because you got poorer. In a commercial society where we're rewarding production and exchange, if I get richer, it's because I made you richer too. We spoke a moment ago, a moment ago at the table about people's incentives relative to the status quo. And we talked about bureaucra uh, bureaucrats, bureaucrats and bureaucracy, and the, the, the rigidity of bureaucratic institutions, the rigidity of, of bureaucracy. In large part, no one wants to rock the boat when they're making bureaucratic decisions. Bureaucrats, you know, bureaucrats have no incentive to really mess with the status quo. Now think about this for a second. Entrepreneurs have lots of incentives to mess with the status quo. Steve Jobs disrupted the status quo. Bill Gates disrupted the status quo. Mark Zuckerberg disrupted the status quo. Everyone at Google disrupts the status quo on a daily basis. What's the difference? Why is it that bureaucrats don't want to disrupt the status quo, while entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, like Bill Gates, like Larry Page, like Mark Zuckerberg, have made careers out of doing that? In large part, it's because of the incentives that they face. It's because of the, in the institutions that are in place. If you're a bureaucrat, you have no incentive to disrupt the status quo, because if you make a mistake, you get nothing but blame. If you make the world a much better place, then okay, maybe you get a pat on the back for it or something like that. In an entrepreneurial marketplace, if you disrupt the status quo by creating Facebook, you become a billionaire. If you disrupt the status quo by creating Google, you become a billionaire. If you disrupt the status quo by creating the iPhone, the revolutionary gadget of the 21st century, you become a billionaire and you make lots and lots and lots of other people rich as well. So why don't bureaucrats disrupt the status quo? Quite simply, it's because there's no money in it. Why do entrepreneurs disrupt the status quo? Pretty obvious, because you can get incredibly, incredibly wealthy by doing so. Now, the effects have been dramatic when we think about countries adopting institutions that reward production and exchange rather than expropriation and redistribution. For almost all of history, for almost all of history, the human condition has been one of wretched poverty, one of absolutely wretched poverty on the bare margin of subsistence. Okay? This changed and changed dramatically, say roughly about 250 years ago, around the middle or so of the 18th century when we began to see an explosion of economic growth that started to take place in Europe and that started to spread overseas. The Western world has seen an explosion in per capita income by not a factor of two or three or four or five or six, but globally by at least a factor of 16, and in some countries by a factor of maybe as much as 100. By adopting, by adopting the institutions of free market capitalism, which the economist Deidre McCluskey defines as, and, and I paraphrase this from memory, a system of social organization based on secure private property rights, including free labor and voluntary exchange, governed by the rule of law and an ethical consensus. Further, 
Um, McCloskey argues that the rise of the modern world is explained by a rhetorical change, um, a rhetorical change that occurred as people came to offer a degree of dignity and esteem to commerce that has been largely absent for most of history. As people came to adopt not just the institutions of capitalism, but also the rhetoric of a well-functioning commercial society where we actually offer a bit of esteem to the people who create the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, we have gotten an enormous explosion in per capita income in the West. Largely, we figured out gains from trade, we figured out innovation, and we started to at least sort of applaud the people who are most responsible for it. Where economic growth has been roughly zero for almost all of history, it has been greater than zero for the last couple of centuries, again, largely limited to Europe and the overseas extensions of Great Britain and France and places like that. But again, <clears throat> countries that have adopted and are adopting more free market oriented institutions are starting to see some of that growth themselves. Okay. Now, let's see what's happened in some of the places where they're beginning to adopt more free market institutions and more of a culture or more of a rhetoric of free markets, capitalism, and entrepreneurship. Specifically, let's move to the second point, which is the consequences. Economic growth in what Andre Schleifer has called the age of Milton Friedman. So Friedman was very, very influential as an intellectual, as a scholar, as a thinker. He was influential as an economist, as purely a scholar, purely a theoretician, purely an economic historian even. He was influential as a teacher teaching generations of students at the University of Chicago to adopt Chicago-style price theory as their fundamental way of thinking about the world. He was also influential as a policy analyst and a public intellectual. He helped to change the rhetoric of the world. And he helped to change the kinds of institutions and incentives, the kinds of policies the countries have adopted. Okay. Now, I think capitalism is great. I think free markets are great. And we have a lot of evidence to back this up. In 2009, the economist Andre Schleifer published an essay in the Journal of Economic Literature in which he summarized some of the things that have happened in the world during what he has called the age of Milton Friedman. This dates from about 1980 to 2005, and it is, in his words, a period during which, quote, the world embraced free market policies, end quote, and experienced rising living standards across a number of different categories. Why 1980? Why would we begin the age of Milton Friedman with 1980? Well, roughly, it was 1979 that Deng Xiaoping began free market reforms in China. It was right around this time that Margaret Thatcher began a program of reform in Great Britain. Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States in 1980, and he too, quote, embraced free market policies, end quote. In Schleifer's words, quote, all three of these leaders professed inspiration from the work of Milton Friedman, end quote. So what happened? First, worldwide growth in per capita GDP over the 25-year period from 1980 through 2005 was about 2% per year. Now notice, for almost all of history, growth in per capita income has not been 2% per year. It's been 0% per year. For almost the entire world over, an annual growth rate in per capita income of about 2% per year over a 25-year period approximates the growth rate in per capita income in the United States over most of the United States' history. There were marked improvements in life expectancy, in infant mortality, in education, and in democratization in countries that adopted um, the policies that would characterize what we might call the age of Milton Friedman. Not only did they get richer, they lived longer, they were healthier, they were better educated, their children didn't die as frequently, and they had more political freedom. In a number of empirical studies, Measures of economic freedom have been shown to predict a variety of social indicators, including but not limited to per capita gross domestic product. In short, I think a little bit of time with the empirical literature on economic freedom and various measures of social well-being will convince you that the case for free markets is not merely convincing, but compelling. One of my favorite economists is Thomas Sowell, very educated at the University of Chicago, very much a scholar in the tradition of Milton Friedman. And one of the things I admire about Sowell is his ability to turn a phrase. Once someone was attacking him for his faith in free markets. You know, you have faith in free markets. And Sowell said, Sowell said, I don't have faith in free markets. I have evidence. It's a big difference between the two. There's a huge difference between blind faith and evidence. And indeed, um, a friend of mine and I, a couple of years ago, wrote an article um, asking whether economists are market fundamentalists and we ask, do we have faith in markets? 
Or is the kind of faith that economists might have in markets, is this blind faith or something like that? And the Bible defines faith as the, uh, 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 the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Indeed, we can see all around us the improvements that free market capitalism has brought us, or the, the improvements that have been brought by free market capitalism. We can see reductions in infant mortality. We can see increases in per capita income. We can see not just the theoretical case for free markets and not just the theoretical case for capitalism, but also in the evidence, in the evidence that confronts us day by day in the world in which we live. Again, I think the case for freedom, the case for free markets is not just convincing, but compelling. Now then, the 20th century also gave us some very clear experiments that effectively allow us to explain the relationship between economic freedom and prosperity. Consider first the differences between East Germany and West Germany. Consider also the differences between North and South Korea. You have, in East and West Germany, roughly a common cultural heritage, and you have a, you have a, a very clear treatment where one side of Germany, East Germany, gets communism. The other side of Germany, West Germany, gets capitalism. After a few decades of this, East Germany is a laggard, and West Germany is one of the world's foremost industrialized economies. Similar story with North and South Korea. Two countries, well indeed one people, one population, um, one culture split in half with the North getting communism, the South getting capitalism, and today South Korea is one of the richest countries in the world, and North Korea is, by God, North Korea is North Korea. It is the absolute backwater basket case, lunatic asylum that North Korea happens to be, where we can't, to the best of my knowledge, we can't very well estimate things like per capita GDP in a country like North Korea. They've consumed all of their capital, and it is, it, it's, 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 it's a hellhole, almost. I mean, it's in, 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 a, in a very, very, very real sense, North Korea is an absolutely horrifically impoverished place as a result of the fact that they socialized ownership of the means of production. Now. Some will argue that capitalism is okay, sure, you know, maybe it delivers the goods, so to speak, it's all well and good, but we can undoubtedly do better. And in the 19th and 20th centuries, a lot of leading intellectuals were convinced that socialism was the answer. Today, a lot of people are convinced that even if socialism itself doesn't work, the government should nonetheless intervene to do a number of different things, to provide basic public goods, to provide education, to correct the distribution of income, to do, a, you know, again, all of these, these wonderful and worthy things. However, as Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, and a number of other people have shown, socialism and interventionism do not only fail in practice, they fail in theory. So let's explore my third point, the third thing I want to talk about, which is the use of force in society. Let's consider the consequences of interventionism. One of Friedrich Hayek's classic contributions is his 1945 article, The Use of Knowledge in Society. It is a decisive refutation, I think, of the claims of the socialists. What I want to consider is sort of a twist on that title, the use of force in society. How can we analyze, using well-done political economy, the interventionist dynamic and the things that government intervention ultimately produces? Now, we know that trade creates wealth, but we have a lot of policies that are enacted in order to restrict or modify trade and its outcomes for the alleged benefit of the poor but we've got to remember that people respond to incentives. People always respond to incentives. They respond to the incentives you put in front of them, and they also respond to incentives even when they work for the government. When we change people's incentives, we change people's behavior. This leads us to an important conclusion. Actions and policies are going to have unintended consequences. The takeaway here is that meaning to help people is not necessarily the same thing as actually helping people. And often, and tragically, the things that we do to help people actually, in fact, make them worse off. In the use of knowledge in society, Friedrich Hayek explained how market prices are not merely efficient ways of organizing information, and they're not merely useful sets of incentives. Market prices are necessary if economic calculation is even going to be possible. If we're going to know whether we're using resources wisely, it's not just nice to have prices. We have to have some way to engage in some type of calculation. Prices are what allow us to do that. 
Now, just as Ludwig von Mises had done in his 1920 essay, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, Hayek engaged in an exercise that some scholars today are calling robust political economy. In short, Mises and Hayek showed how even under the best of assumptions about the knowledge available to the central planners and under the best of possible assumptions about the planners' motives, private ownership of the means of production and market exchange are necessary if the information needed for rational economic calculation is even going to exist. Here's how. Now, first, let's assume, as Mises did, that by some miracle, we as members of society know exactly what to produce. So we just by hypothesis, we know exactly what to produce. We know exactly how much wine to produce, exactly how much flank steak to produce, exactly how much uh, rack of lamb to produce, exactly how much dessert to produce, exactly how much steak sauce to produce, and so on and so forth. By hypothesis, we just, God hands us the information, we know what to produce. We know every conceivable way of producing it. We know every possible way to produce all of society's output, and we have a complete inventory of all the resources that are available for production. So we know exactly what to produce, we know all of the possible ways we can produce it, and we also know what exactly we have on hand in order to engage in that kind of production. Let's also assume, as did Mises, Hayek, and Friedman, that the central planners are motivated not by any desire for personal gain, but by a desire to do the most good for the society that is under their care. Even in this ideal case, rational economic calculation is not possible without private ownership of the means of production. Private property gives rise to exchange, which allows the establishment of prices. Prices then allow people to estimate the cost and benefits of their actions. Profits and losses then tell entrepreneurs whether they're using resources wisely or wastefully. When the means of production are commonly owned, there can be no exchange by necessity. When the means of production are commonly owned, there can be no exchange because there are no private property titles to exchange. There can be no prices. There can be no profits and losses. Therefore, there can be no economic calculation. There can be literally no way to know whether a particular production process is wise or wasteful. This is the contribution of Mises in his 1920 essay. And what I think is one of the most important contributions ever made in the social sciences. Hayek carried this a step further in his 1945 essay by pointing out that the economic problem is not one of solving a system of equations given a bunch of constraints. Rather, the economic problem is one of assembling and harnessing the knowledge that is distributed across today, what are billions and billions of individual minds. Hayek made reference to what he called the particular circumstances of time and place that cannot be known by central planners. I met a lot of y'all for the first time today. I know relatively little about your tastes, about your preferences, about your allergies, about what you do for fun, so on and so forth. It would be the height of presumption for me to think that I and a group of my friends can plan your life for you. Indeed, it would be the height of folly to think that I could decide for you what is best for you, given that I really honestly don't know that much about you. And yet, that's an experiment that was tried in the 20th century. To use just this one example, my knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place in the Bahamas is actually pretty limited. My knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place in Memphis, Tennessee, where we live, and in Birmingham, Alabama, where we're moving, is also incredibly limited. Hayek's argument, Hayek's thesis, and Hayek's contribution basically said that markets are not just nice to have, Markets are the necessary set of social institutions that allow for the creation, the generation, the assembly, and the dissemination of the information that is needed for rational economic calculation to even take place. So I'm gonna close this with a plea for humility that originates in Adam Smith and that carries through Mises, through Hayek, and through Friedman. So here's my plea for humility. Let's consider two passages from Adam Smith. The first is from his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. In it, Smith introduces us to a character that he calls the man of system. Here's Adam Smith. The man of system is apt to be very wise in his own conceit and is often so enamored with the supposed beauty of his own ideal plan of government that he cannot suffer the smallest deviation from any part of it. 
He goes on to establish it completely and in all its parts without any regard either to the great interests or to the strong prejudices which may oppose it. He seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that the pieces upon the chessboard have no other principle of motion besides that which the hand impresses upon them, but that in the great chessboard of human society, every single piece, every single piece has a principle of motion of its own altogether different from that which the legislature might choose to impress upon it. If these two principles coincide and act in the same direction, the game of human society will go on easily and harmoniously, and it is very likely to be happy and successful. If they are opposite or different, the game will go on miserably, and the society must at all times, or the society must be at all times in the highest degree of disorder. A second passage from Adam Smith, this one from The Wealth of Nations. Quote, the statesman who should attempt to direct private people in what manner they ought to employ their capitals would not only load himself with the most unnecessary attention, but assume an authority which could be safely trusted, not only to no single person, but to no council or senate whatever, and which would nowhere be so dangerous as in the hands of a man who has folly and presumption enough to fancy himself fit to exercise it." End quote. According to the philosopher James Otteson, Smith identifies what Otteson calls the great mind fallacy. This is the assumption that somewhere there's some person or some group who can organize society coherently and do so intentionally and from the top down. You just had an election in the Bahamas. We're on the verge of a presidential election in the United States. In so many cases, it's clear that what people think the relevant question is concerns getting the right people in leadership. This is a mistake, however. It's not about making sure that the right people at the top have power. It's about making sure that everyone has freedom. But what does this freedom mean? We know that interventionism fails. In its logical extreme, socialism fails. How then does freedom empower people to make the most of their God-given potential? Here's Milton Friedman from Capitalism and Freedom on how markets coordinate economic activity and on the case against those markets specifically. Friedman, so long as effective freedom of exchange is maintained, the central feature of the market organization of economic activity is that it prevents one person from interfering with another in respect of most of his activities. The consumer is protected from coercion by the seller because of the presence of other sellers with whom he can deal. The seller is protected from coercion by the consumer because of other consumers to whom he can sell. The employee is protected by coercion from, the, uh, from coercion by the employer because of other employers for whom he can work, and so on. And the market does this impersonally and without centralized authority. Indeed, it's a process that's probably miraculous. Here, though, is Friedman on the case against free markets. Indeed, a major source of objection to a free economy is precisely that it does this task so well. It gives people what they want instead of what a particular group thinks they ought to want. Underlying most arguments against the free market is a lack of be belief in freedom itself. I'll repeat that last line. Underlying most arguments against the free market is a lack of belief in freedom itself. And yet, the history of the last several centuries has given us numerous reasons, both theoretical and empirical, to believe in freedom. The bloodbaths that were created in countries like China and the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany as a result of people denying freedom, as a result of people not believing in freedom, also again give us a reason to believe in simple freedom, in simple human liberty. I believe in freedom. I hope you'll believe in freedom too. Our future and our children's future depend on freedom.